Hi guys, Ree here. Welcome back to another episode of the Real Talk with Ree podcast. So today we are talking about the unseen struggles of parents with ALN, additional learning needs children. Um, just to kind of caveat this, this is not me moaning or complaining about my children um, who I adore with all my heart. I wouldn't change a single thing about them. However, um, the system that surrounds children with additional learning needs, um, specifically um, in my experience, I would be mostly talking today about children with autism because all four of my children have autism. Um, sometimes the world around them can make things quite challenging, uh, especially as a mum who, as all mums, wants the best for our children. And I think there are so many struggles in the way that the world is becoming more neurodivergent friendly but there are still some real challenges and hurdles that we have to navigate as ALM parents that I think perhaps if you've just got neurotypical children, it wouldn't even enter your head. So the purpose of this little chat is to kind of raise awareness, I guess, a little bit. So if you are a parent with ALM children, then maybe you want to send this episode to someone in your life who doesn't quite understand and you know said with love people can't understand until they've been there um doesn't understand perhaps some of the challenges you face um and also to kind of just be like high five other parents who are in the same situation sometimes just knowing you're not on your own can help so much from my experience anyway because sometimes it just feels like why is this so hard why is this such a struggle and just knowing you're not the only one and you're you're not going a little bit mad even though it feels like you are can help so much so hopefully that's kind of the the, the purpose of today's little chat uh, and without further ado let, let's get into it shall we so one of the things that um that as a parent of children with autism specifically and I've got to say a lot of these things because I, I didn't know when all my children were little they all had autism and then I found out one at a time so many of these things I'm going to say I thought were inverted commas normal. I thought so many of these things were everybody problems, but turns out a lot of these things are problems specific to parents of children on the spectrum or with other additional needs. So this, uh, this first one, worrying about running out of things. Okay, so I have a lot of things in place. We have a system. If you've ever watched my grocery hauls, meal planning videos over on my main channel, um, I always have a system of one to use and one as a backup because when we run out of certain things as um, a very neuro, neuro spicy house, um, I think my um, therapist once called me the queen of my neuro spicy household, which I quite liked, quite like that term. Um, but yeah, she, um, as um, a parent of neurodivergent children, running out of things that they are expecting to have can be very upsetting for them. So if they are used to eating a certain cereal, often children with autism, that is all they will eat. And if they do not have that thing to eat, they would rather starve. Um, and this kind of came to light when Will, who's my second child, but first to be diagnosed, I was having a chat with his consultant and I said, look, I've got to ask, what do I do about food? Because he's so like, fussy and rigid with his food that I like how do I kind of coax him out of this like people say to do the like tough love kind of thing like here's your dinner if you're hungry enough you'll eat and if not then whatever and eventually he would just eat more food um and just to say if, you, like, if you've watched videos where you've, you've heard me talk about this he was like an amazingly healthy eater but very very rigid he would eat the same breakfast the same lunch and the same dinner to the point where if we went out for a meal I had to take food that I had prepared it with like, this one vegetable and chicken pasta um, dish he would eat and I'd have to make it in bulk like I was making it in some sort of factory and freeze it into pre-portioned things to bring out for his dinner every day otherwise he would not eat he is an amazing eater now like an absolutely amazing eater and um, how we've gone from A to B on that is a whole other video and let me know if you want me to talk about that but um, back then he was so rigid and the, what the consultant said to me is yeah with a neurotypical child you could probably do the look if you're hungry enough you'll eat this and eventually they would they would just eat it but with a neurodivergent child specifically a child with autism they might just starve themselves so 
it is quite important not to run out of certain things. And I didn't realise that like how specific this was to autism until I was talking to my best friend and and um, she was saying, you know, of the, if her children, if she'd run out of a certain thing, her children would just eat something out, like a certain breakfast food. And I was like, hang on, hold the phone. If you've run out of a certain thing, they would just eat a different thing with no arguing. Like you wouldn't have to coax them or transition them or do a social story about it. They would just eat a different thing. <laughs> it's like, okay, this has blown my tiny little mind. But apparently that's the thing. I like, it blew my mind. But apparently some people just, so running out of things wouldn't be that big a deal because you could just eat something else. Whereas for children with autism specifically, again, Will's so much better now. Like he's, he is positively unbothered now compared to how he was with um, food and things. Like he will really eat so well and try so many things. In fact, he is more adventurous and eater than me. But when he was little, it had to be like, very specific I need this brand of this he got really upset with me when he was little once when I bought the wrong brand of soap because the wording was different back when I used to have like actual hand pump soap in the bathroom now actually one of the excellent ways to get around this is to have a container attached to the sink in the bathroom that I top up so you can't actually see the packaging which gets around a little bit of that but yeah packaging changing on things can really upset children with autism um, and certainly getting different things like for example um I did a grocery haul I was gonna <laughs> I was gonna do a bit of a grocery haul series on my main channel and um I did the first one where I did a grocery haul from Sainsbury's which was the stuff I normally buy and this I thought this this is like a good base point to what I normally buy and the intention was to go around different supermarkets and like be more adventurous and try different things so I started with Aldi and uh, people seem to really enjoy the video and I did a come shop with me and Aldi and then I did a haul but the grief I had from my family from our eldest is currently at university but from my husband and three children still at home about the stuff I bought from Aldi that was different people are like when are you doing your next one I'm like oh I'm not sure if I can because actually it just spun them all out all of them including my husband so yeah that's worrying about running out of things apparently not everyone has to deal with that Routine and structure. So again, I know that not every family needs the routine and structure that our family has. For us, I feel like my children with autism need routine and structure because it just makes them feel safe and they know where they are. And if I have to make a change to that routine, I have to notify them and then kind of help them manage that transition um, for them to be okay. For me, who was diagnosed with ADHD this year, I've realized that routine helps me because it just automates things and takes things off my cognitive load, off my brain. It's less for me to have to think about. And then that helps my very loud and muddled brain manage with all the things I have to get done. So routine and structure works so well in our very new spicy house, but just for different reasons for me and for my children. So apparently though, <laughs> some people in some houses without neurodivergence can just be really go with the flow and have just have meals at different times every day and do things last minute and surprise their children with things um so this, this is another one actually so um so many parents are like we're going to disney kids today Woo! and the children are thrilled they're thrilled so i had this chat with with our children um and I said, you know, guys, some people just go to Disney like last minute. They're like, we're packed. We're going to we pick you up from school and we're going now. And bear in mind, our children love Disney. Like they love it. I've got a separate Disney channel where you can go and watch all our very many Disney trip vlog series. They live and breathe it. They love it. So I said, how would you feel if I did that? They were like, oh, I don't think I'd like that. All three of them were like, nope, mm -mm. nope. I love Disney, but don't spring it on me like that. <laughs> they said they like helping with the planning. But then I think they um, they enjoy that element of knowing what's coming. They like knowing where they're going. They like to plan things in advance. If they haven't been somewhere before, they like to watch other people's vlogs to know what to expect. Because when they get there, they feel more comfortable. Um, the way, like I, this is not a scientific, I'm not a doctor. Um, but the way I have observed my children's autism working, it's like their um, reticular activating system with, you know, you you take the filter then um, where your brain takes things in or doesn't take things in. It's like the dial is adjusted slightly where they're taking in a little bit too much detail and they're trying to like take a photographic 
memory of everything every time they go somewhere. So when they go somewhere that they've been before and it's familiar, they're like, okay, right, so that's familiar, that's familiar, that's familiar. Or maybe that's changed, maybe the Christmas tree there now. But other than that, it's pretty familiar and they feel like it's less overwhelming for them. But if their brain's trying to take in every detail and they're like, okay, I've already recorded all those details, that's just one new detail, that would explain why um, they, you know, kind of prefer to do things that they're familiar with. So yeah, it was really interesting because I kind of knew that's what they'd say. My husband was like, no, they'd be fine. I was like, let's ask them. <laughs> and all three of them, like, it's like their faces dropped. They're like, no, I don't, I don't really don't think I'd like that at all. Um, which is interesting. Um, so I can surprise them in that surprise kids. I've booked this trip. We're going in however many weeks or whatever. And that would be a fun surprise. And I did that when I booked the first ever Disney cruise. And there's a video you can watch over on my Disney channel if you scroll way back. Um, like a trip announcement and I did like a follow the string thing. Like we booked a Disney cruise, we're going on a Disney cruise, woo! But then we had so much time to plan it um, and become familiar with it. If I was like, woo, we're going now, they would have been like, ooh. So yeah, planning surprises like that. Um, and in fact, interestingly, um, I'm currently recording this. Um, I'm being super, super organized. I'm currently recording this uh, right at the end of August. Um, you should be listening to this in September or, or later, perhaps if you're catching up. Um, but we're about to go on a Disney cruise um, on the Disney Wish. Not the Disney Wish, the Disney Dream. We went on the Disney Wish last time. But last year, we also went on the Disney Dream. So we've been on the Disney Dream before. And the children have watched all episodes of the Disney Dream vlog series. They've all been like, they've been so excited for it. And I feel like because we're going back on a ship they're familiar with, they're even more excited than if they'd never been. And I feel like they'll get more out of it and they'll enjoy it more. Um, so yeah, that's just perhaps something, this like surprise element and the lack of preparation that you would have the option to do if you have neurotypical children to be like really fly by the seat of your pants and like hey there's a deal we can just go and do this thing without planning or preparing or making sure they've got all the right things or you know you could just be like oh whatever and we'll pack when we you know pack whatever and whatever we haven't got we'll buy and be that really like chilled mum that I'd love to be but I feel like I can't be that chilled mum because if I was that chilled mum then my children would be so dysregulated they wouldn't be able to enjoy whatever surprise we planned for them. So that is, I think, a struggle that is quite specific to parents with children with autism, perhaps other um, additional learning needs too, but definitely with autism. Um, so another um, big struggle that people won't necessarily appreciate or understand until they've been through it is how much fighting you have to do for your children when they have additional learning needs. And this is not specific to autism, sadly. I think this is very much across the board with any additional learning needs. And the fighting comes in so many different like formats. So it's like fighting to get people to listen to you, especially when children are masking in school. So maybe your children like mine mask so well in school and then you can clearly see they have whatever issues they have, but they, they mask them so well. And this is especially prevalent with girls. And when your children are masking in certain settings, trying to get the support of teachers, school staff, whatever, to even look into things can be really challenging. And sometimes you're made to feel like you're a bit like mad, a bit like making things up in your head. Um, I found this especially when, so, well, baby number two was the first one to be diagnosed with autism. And then I started seeing signs in my eldest daughter, who's baby number three. And I was very much second guessing myself and like, oh, am I just seeing this everywhere? Because, am I seeing autism everywhere because I'm so immersed in it? Is it all in my head? But then that made it so hard because I knew that she needed to be assessed because I knew that the only way to know was this in my head or not was to get assessed because I'm not a doctor. The only way to assess is to actually do the assessment. And I knew this needed to happen. And the schools didn't see stuff in school because the girls mask so well and they present so differently. So that was a real challenge. And then with the third child to be just diagnosed, fourth baby, um, I had a massive battle with the doctors. There was one specific doctor who was going to dismiss her from the assessment process. And obviously I'd been through this whole thing twice now. So I knew what they need to be looking for. Um, I was sort of no longer in a, oh, maybe you know best, sort of like, I know they knew best for the doctors, but I knew what kind of duty of care to expect. 
Um, so she did this chat with me where I gave evidence that Zara, you know, which definitely indicated the evidence I gave that she needed to be assessed. Um, and while I was having this chat, so this, this doctor was facing me and Zara was playing behind her, like with some little toys they put out. And I knew categorically this woman hadn't witnessed enough of Zara's behavior to make, um, because to, to make a, a fair judgment because she was looking at me, not Zara. She hadn't physically seen, I hadn't witnessed her physically looking at her enough to make this assessment, um, whether she needed an assessment uh, to, to decide then what she needed an assessment. Um, and she was like, nope, she doesn't meet the criteria. I was like, well, I, I actually know that she does. And I actually know that you haven't actually looked at her enough to decide for yourself with your own eyes if she does. And that was such a fight. And you made to kind of feel like, oh, you know, you and Dr. Google, are you a doctor? How many years of medical experience have you got? Whatever. But ultimately, you know your own child. You know your own child's needs. And especially when you've already been through the process, being kind of fobbed off like that. And it's such a roller coaster between, oh, am I just making a fuss? Is it all in my head? And then having to fight and fight and fight and like push back and be like, no, this isn't right. Um, I need to be able to complain. I need to. So then I ended up having a meeting with someone higher up in the department eventually they agreed to assess her and she was diagnosed so if I hadn't pushed for that she would have been fobbed off she wouldn't have been diagnosed and then I wouldn't have been able to access any help that she needs as she goes through school and that would all been because I'd been like okay yeah fine whatever you know best even though I knew she hadn't actually looked at her to know to really know you know so that fight is exhausting it's so draining and it's it's not something I ever regret doing it just feels so wrong that it has to be such a fight and so many hoops to jump through. Um, I have actually put together um, something that I wish that I'd had, um, which is a printable PDF. And if you go to mummy of four, M-U-M-M-Y-O-F for the word F-O-U-R dot com forward slash 100 A-S-D, that's mummy of four dot com forward slash 100 A-S-D, then I will send you via email um, a document that would help me so much when my children were being assessed and that is um it's 100 signs of autism in children now it's not a diagnostic document it's just um 100 different tiny little things that you would be sort of be wise to have front of mind to be looking out for and that way you can go into these meetings prepared with actually i've noticed da, 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 in my child or i have not noticed these things in my child because people used to ask me these things especially when my first child was being assessed does he do this does he do that and i'd be like oh i don't know i feel like i haven't been looking out for that because i didn't know that was a thing and now because i didn't know that was a thing i wasn't looking out for it and now i feel like i'm not giving an accurate enough representation of my child and it made me just feel flustered and like a terrible mother so hopefully that will help you like i said it doesn't just because they do all or none of the things on that pdf doesn't mean they do or do not have autism but it's just designed to be a conversation starter to kind of open your eyes a little bit as a parent to the things you might want to be looking out for before you go into these chats so hopefully that will help anyway um so yeah having to do all this extra fighting having to deal with extra meetings for behavioral interventions and ehcps and uh statements they've kind of gone now but you know all this just all the extra meetings all the extra touch points i find that as a parent of children with aln you get to know the staff in the school so well and if i don't may i suggest that you you know, if you don't currently, may I suggest that you do because it's so valuable to have that extra relationship with the staff. And I would highly recommend just like helping out whenever you can, saying yes to going on trips. Um, just make it known to the staff that you are open to conversations, you are open to staying in touch, you are open to being available to help. Because staff in schools are always really grateful for anyone that they know that they can approach because I think so many parents, especially when they're initially faced with or oh, your child might have these additional needs absolutely lose it they just i've got a lot of friends who are teachers and they've had so many apparently you know calm normal inverted commas parents um just lose it with them and get really angry so i think if teachers know that you're approachable they can they're going to be far more likely to be able to talk to you and keep the conversation flowing um, which is obviously really important if you have a child with additional needs. Um, whereas some parents perhaps wouldn't speak to the teachers other than parents evening, you know? Um, so that's just a massive difference. Um, another one, which this is one of the ones that kind of prompted um, this whole episode actually, is when there are like extra days in school, you know, when it's dressing up day or uh, like Bella had to wear old clothes one day to go in to paint something. 
and she doesn't have because she's grown so quickly there are not any like she doesn't have like clothes with holes in or like that would fit her you know what I mean nothing that she considered to be like old and tatty enough for this job so I was like look um just wear this polo shirt it's got a bit of a mark on it anyway um it's one of your school polo shirts just wear your scruffiest school polo shirt and if you get paint on it I'll replace it because they're just from supermarkets you know the their school polo shirts are not expensive ones and she just could not get a hand she's like no but I've been told I have to wear old clothes it's like well this is fine I'm saying this is fine the teacher means something you don't mind getting ruined and I don't mind if you ruin that but she just could not get her head around this um or the anxiety of it being world book day and and it being a dress up day or the anxiety of coming up to Christmas and actually they haven't got a normal routine in school the anxiety it causes for a child with autism when all of that is thrown off and then ultimately you're dealing with lots of anxiety and stress leading up to the day and kind of very dysregulated children when you pick them up from school and often other people won't see that because they'll just see quite a regulated child in public but you will they won't have seen the tears and the upset before or after that so if you're dealing with that as a parent of children with autism i see you big internet podcast hugs um because another thing obviously to have to deal with is meltdowns which i think a lot of people that don't know better think are tantrums and um <clears throat> excuse me the i think the big difference between a meltdown and a tantrum is the impact it has on a child so i think that for example and i would never suggest that this is a good idea but if you had a child having a tantrum because they wanted this i'm holding up my phone and you're like, no, no, you can't have it, you can't have it. And they have a tantrum and then you're like, fine, you can have it. Like, I'm never suggesting that's a really good idea because that's probably going to encourage them to tantrum in order to get the things they want. But if you did that and you gave it to them and they went, Loop, stop crying and immediately were fine. To me, that's a tantrum. For a child with autism, if they have got something in their head and they are having a meltdown about it, even if you're like, fine, it's okay. Whatever you were initially melting down over, it's fixed, has been replaced, I'm going to give you whatever it's like they still can't regulate. So it's more like they are just melting down in themselves as opposed to they are performing a behavior to try and get a reaction out of you. And I would say that's a big difference between a meltdown and a tantrum. But to the untrained eye, when you see children with autism melting down in public, it can look a lot like a tantrum. And then the other thing, of course, you've got to deal with is like other judgy people. Um, And something else you have to deal with as a parent of children with autism is just friends and family that just don't get it. They just do not get it and it's like oh they seem fine to me they don't look like they have autism we are all things i have heard from people in my life oh they don't they don't look autistic um and they're all just refusing to believe it and be like no they don't have that or getting upset (laughs) when they've been diagnosed we had family members doing that um which it's their own journey it's their own feelings or whatever but largely unhelpful when you've been going through this whole process and you're trying to parent your own children um but yeah it can be it can be really challenging having to deal with, um, or I had a family member that told me that I'd made William like that when he was, he it was he was challenging at that age when he was toddler. But yeah, that I, I'd caused that. Um, so yeah, that's perhaps a struggle that um, parents of neurotypical children wouldn't necessarily have. Um, obviously there are communication challenges, um, potentially with children with autism. Um, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to get them to open up. You have to be a lot clearer with your communication. Um, I could talk endlessly actually about the things that can help children with autism and let me know if you have any specific questions um, because I'm happy to do deep dive podcast episodes on specific questions you have if you want to leave in the comments or email them to me. Um, But I think that um, there are so many things that can be done to help children with autism. I mean, and large of them are just, largely they're very just sound parenting advice most of it um and although a lot of it would help children whether they're on the spectrum or not and i'm sure children could benefit from it it's the fact that these extra strategies are just necessary and essential for children with autism and you can get away without doing all that stuff that extra learning that extra reading um if you you don't have children with those additional needs you can be dealing with um challenges with dietary requirements with what they'll eat you're far more likely to have fussy eaters um and i mean hats off to everyone that does it but for children with allergies and things the challenges for that when you've got a child that's got a severe allergy to something must be just it blows my mind how difficult that must be eating out 
going to school, just doing all the basic things that we take for granted. So although we've dealt with fuss eating, obviously, um, having those additional challenges of medical things that could possibly hurt your child physically and so quickly must be such a massive just addition to a cognitive load, such a massive additional worry. Um, There's extra preparing. I think one of the things for children with additional needs, specifically autism, is just there's just a lot more to do and to get ready. So this is part of the reason I pack early when we're going away because I know that if I've forgotten certain things for certain family members, their day will be ruined. And as much as my husband's always been like, chill, whatever, don't stress about it. You know, when we get there, we'll like, you know, pick up whatever we need. It doesn't matter. Just throw in a carry bag is what he used to say. Um, ultimately, if I've forgotten the things that he needs, he's very upset <laughs> and it ruins his day. And the children are the same. So although it's taken him a while to realise that this is not me just being fussy, this is actually what needs to be done in order to preempt everyone's needs and make sure everyone is in the best position to remain happy and enjoy the trip. It's, just, it's I think, you know, not just that it's actually necessary. Um, and... I guess that level of preparation just wouldn't be necessary if the children, um, well, I guess if you just had neurotypical children that were a bit more relaxed and chilled out and weren't likely to become upset if certain things were forgotten. So I think it's obviously going to be different for every family and you're going to have some children that are not neurodivergent that are still anxious if you've forgotten things. Obviously, it's a spectrum. But I think... It can be hard for families who don't have these challenges to understand why mums who are potentially sort of trying to preempt problems and put out fires before they even start, that's sort of what I'm trying to do all the time, they can, like, we can be perceived as fussy or overbearing or whatever. Whereas ultimately it's just like, have I remembered everything to make sure that everyone's happy while we're away? Because that is absolutely my job and absolutely something I don't mind doing. But it is quite a lot of pressure because I just don't want to ruin anyone's day. Um, And I think one thing that uh, people who have not got children just with autism, I I guess this perhaps happens with other things too, may not experience, is seeing it everywhere. And it's really awkward because before I knew about autism, the way I understand it now, I didn't know many people at all with autism and I certainly didn't spot it anywhere. Now, the more I know about it... And the, this is sort of becoming the thing with ADHD as well, since I've been diagnosed. The more I learn about it, the more I educate myself, the more I do see it everywhere. And it's really awkward because you can't go up to people going, hey, did you know that <laughs> your child possibly has autism? You can't do that. It's not appropriate. But it's also really awkward because you know that someone had been able to, and I don't know how someone would be able to politely say that without upsetting people, but if someone had said that to you earlier and you'd known earlier about your own child's needs, you would have been able to help them sooner. So it's just this really awkward situation where you see it everywhere in adults in your life as well as children and you still can't really say anything. <laughs> you just have to quietly keep it to yourself um, and that can sometimes feel a bit weird if I'm honest. That can sometimes feel a bit strange and I don't think this is just a me thing. Every other parent of children with autism or ADHD or whatever neurodivergence um, they might be dealing with says the same. They're like, oh yeah. And you, you can just spot it in, and and obviously, I'm, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not able to actually diagnose people. But I could definitely point out in my own mind um, people that perhaps would benefit from being on the assessment pathway. I think, um, let me know actually, if you are a children, um, are a children, have children with additional needs, if you experience the same. If you're watching on YouTube, you can uh, let me know down in the comments. And if you are listening just on the podcast version, then I guess you could comment over on YouTube. You could head to the video on YouTube um, or just hit me up on Instagram, um, which is Real Talk with Real Podcast over there, um, or my main Mummy of 4 UK Instagram. Um, and just share in your stories um, and tag me um, which are your specific struggles that you notice that parents or children with additional lonely needs face and perhaps other parents don't have to deal with. Uh, Be interested to see which other struggles you've picked up on uh, because I bet if you've picked up on them, 
a lot of other people have too so let us know down in the comments so thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of real talk with re i shall catch you next week bye